Okay, so today, basically, I, um, I'm going to talk to you guys about things I've seen in the semiconductor industry over the past 15 years. I've reverse engineered several hundred different devices over, you know, from the early 90s till today. Actually, um, it's almost 20 years, I guess, but who's counting? And so um, I just thought I'd sit down and, and uh, show everybody like some, some, uh, some things that I've come across, meshes, things like this, before the meshes, the, things, the way things used to be into the way things are today. And um, it's interesting because things haven't changed that much, but they've changed enough that it's, it is different. But yet when you, if, you're, if you're involved from it on a daily basis, you realize that it's not that much different, but it would look at from the outside, you know, for, uh, you know, and it, the introduction of the analysis. So you get involved in it and then you realize it's not much different than it was, but it's smaller. So um, at the end of the slides, I'm going to go through some slides with you guys and then when it's all done, uh, we'll, I was told by all you guys last night uh, that you want to see porn. So I have about 100 gigs of it and uh, <laughs> the drive's right here <laughs> so we can, you know, and not really porn, but you know, chips. So, okay. Um, I want to thank you too for, for coming this late in the day because it's, uh, it's been a long day for a lot of us. So, and uh, at the end of this, if you could fill out your feedback card, because Black Hat, I never get any feedback from these talks. And so I know I'll forget to tell you at the end of this, so I wanted to tell you at the beginning of this. So, who here works with semiconductors? Everybody almost? Okay. Embedded smart card or just like, Microcontrollers, what kind, uh, what, what kind, somebody? You design them. You design microprocessors? Uh, uh, ASICs. ASICs, nice, nice. What process do you guys use? Uh, no, 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 not, not the fab, but what, what size, like 90 nanometer? Nice, nice. So today I'll take you to 90. That's as low as we're going to go. We could go to 45 or 32, but I don't, I don't, I have never seen a smart card that low yet. But um, I'm sure they're going to come sooner or later because everybody uses, like you said, they're fabulous a lot of these places today. So they're going to TSMC and TMC and, and uh, they've got the process down pretty pat. So in the past, there weren't really any security challenges. If you could put a needle on the bus, uh, which was humongous. We're talking over a micron. In, in the 80s, things were 3 micron, 10 micron, NMOS, PMOS. Um, things weren't even CMOS back then. And so uh, the geometries were so huge, you didn't even need things like, uh, like, like what I'm discussing here below. You know, a probe, you needed a probe station, yes. But you didn't really need an optical microscope. You could use you didn't, a good optical microscope. You could use a very cheap dark field type microscope because everything, the wire sizes were, were humongous. Um, any wire size that was above one micron, you didn't even need a laser cutter. A uh, laser cutter is going to be good from about a large scale chip above a micron down to about 350 nanometers if the wire size has some space, uh, in other words, if, if there's some separation between the track. If their tracks are tight, your, your laser is going to probably short two tracks out. Um, so back in the 80s and the 90s, you could get away with a very cheap probe station. Who here saw my DEF CON presentation in 2008 where we probed a bus? Okay. We put a single needle on the data bus. I think it was D, uh, D0, the, le the least significant bit of an 8051. And with one glitch, we made the loop repeat 256 times to spill RAM or to spill the Infineon CMS, uh, some, some extra datas. And so it's, uh, it, 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 that was a makeshift probe station. Uh, you know, I, I used uh, tape to hold the, the micropositioner in place. And then I used Velcro for the actual um, the, la the landing area to hold that down. So I mean, you you can make things out of anything almost on the to work with the old stuff. Um, so anyway, did, you know I don't know if you're aware of this, but most people out here that read these data sheets they trust the manufacturers. So ST tells you, oh, uh, I, we run on the internal clock. We never come. We never begin on the outside clock. And we scramble, the bus is scrambled, fetches are encrypted from ROM, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Half the time this is BS, it's smoke and mirrors. And I like to say they're peddling snake oil. And uh, the ST, I said ST because ST is famous for this. ST today will tell you that they've encrypted their ROM, and really what they've done is they've done an XOR against a static pattern. So depending where your high address is in the physical fetch, depends which XOR, uh, you know, byte you're going to f ex exclusive or the fetch against. 
A lot of these companies will tell you something like Infineon, this is, they're famous, Siemens Infineon back in the 90s, even today. Um, visible, uh, ROM implant, due to ROM implantation uh, via, you know, ion implantation, ROM not visible. But guess what? Anybody here ever heard of a dash etching stain? No, so dash etching stain is uh, like a one part hydrofluoric, one part nitric, and like eight parts of uh, acidic acid. When you put this down on, on the substrate, on a, on a delayered substrate, it, do it, it accents the p-type dopings, so they change color. And this takes a lot of practice, and it's, it's not something that I normally do because I have other ways of reading the ROM out. Um, but vi invisible ROMs can be made very visible, uh, very easily. The security on these chips is usually very simplistic to bypass. Um, it's the, uh, it's, uh, you know, today, m in the past, they used microcode. Everybody ran on PLA or microcode table. In fact, a lot of them gave Intel a copyright uh, Im logo imprint uh, saying, you know, copyright Intel 1978. Right there, boom, 8051, if you didn't know what it was. Um, today, today they run on most of the time pure logic, so it's a, it's a pure logic implementation of, of a CPU design. And it's good, but it still needs improvement. And I'll, um, we'll, get into, we'll get into that a little bit later. Does anybody have questions so far? No? I don't know why, but every time I speak I'm very nervous. <laughs> so I'm losing my thoughts, so anyway. Okay. So what makes a device secure? Anybody? Okay. Masked or implanted ROM, yeah, you know, contents. Uh, lack of public documentation half the time. They try to control it. Maxim Dallas controls their documentation for their DS2432, their 28 series uh, one wire devices, for example, their SHA 1 authentication parts. Every smart card, you have to sign an NDA to get the documents. Microchip, um, I'm sorry, not microchip. Um, Philips, NXP has, uh, has these for their little uh, transponder ICs. Um, they basically try to control the distribution of the documents and therefore I guess it adds a level of security and it does to a certain extent but it's not, if I can get these documents when I have no business having these documents then obviously that's not a, a direction that they should rely on. Um, they don't typically use a standard bootloader to, to load these memories. For example, it's a masked ROM or it's an ion implanted ROM as I stated above. So that means that basically you do your design, you simulate your design, you feed it off to ST or whoever it is and they produce a mask, you know, of the chip for you. Um, the bootloader, if it's like an app, a flash based MCU, is, is customized with a password for your, for you the customer. Um, a lot of these times these chips end up on the surplus market of like HKInventory.com, HongKongInventory.com and uh, you can pick up these devices for as little as 15 cents. Did anybody see my talk in, online from um, Black Hat in uh, either Spain or DC this year with the TPM hack? So I bought I think like 200 SLE 66 and PE Infineon chips from, uh, from the Hong Kong inventory for I think it was like 15 or 30 cents each, very cheap. And I recently uh, received 243 pieces of a Thompson uh, TPM device. So I think Thompson will be next, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> so, um, so what do you guys think? This is an off the shelf micro, is it secure? Because I just want to give you guys an, uh, some examples here. Like here's an Atmel, this is an 18 mega 256.0, so 2560. It's got 256K of uh, kilobytes of flash, it's got some EEPROM. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty nice, I mean, do you guys think it's secure? Nobody? Okay, well, well you have to wait till the end. <laughs> so in the really, really old days, you could literally see the ROM bits on some ROMs if they were masked. It just depends what metal layer, how they designed the ROM and what metal layer the ROM bits were visible on. Um, so here you can see in this picture, I can read this out like, like a book. In these columns, let me, let me open this to a larger picture. This, this is an Oki Data 8051 from like 1985, but it's just to give you guys like, you know, some, some examples here. So out of view are the column decoders and basically the, all the D0 bits of this ROM come out of the first, the, uh, come out, there's 32 across, 32 of these small, these, uh, these small T's and so, Every four T's represents one bit weight. So, so these four T's, let me see if I can highlight this. Everything 
he, oops, hold on. Everything from here down basically represents D0 depending what address you're at in the ROM. And then everything on this next, these next four represented D1 and then so forth across it. But as you can see, using, using a technique called, on an optical microscope called dark field, uh, I, can, I can bend the light in such a way that it actually accents the ROM bits. And so you can see clearly, I don't know which way it went, if it was, if a, if a, if a solid was one or a solid was zero. It just depends how the ROM was designed. But with today's computers, you can, you can just translate this table any way you want to and you can play with it in software to figure, you know, to understand, you know it's an 8051, so your software can, can deduce what these bits, you know, flip them, flip the state that you re recorded it as or don't. And so it's, um, it's, it's pretty cool. Good old sky period seven. Anybody here from the UK, from, from England or Europe? Anybody here into like satellite television from over there in the past? So in like 1992, uh, a company called NDS out of Israel who I used to work for produces this chip for Rupert Murdoch's sky broadcasting system. And so just, this is just to give you an example of a secure smart card from 1993, 1991 maybe, that, that, uh, I mean, where's the security really because the only thing that made this secure was the fact that it had a mask ROM. So that it means that NDS designed the ROM, simulated it, sent it off for production by Motorola. This was known as a, as a, oh, whoops, hold on a second. This, this was mo known as a 68HC05 SC24. It's basically any chip that they produced that had a masked ROM and no type of bootloader to load it was called an SC series. And they made several different ones. So you had five major pads on this chip. Let me open it again, large. And you guys are welcome to all these pictures. I'll zip them up and when I return home, I'll, uh, I'll throw, them, throw them up on flylogic.net and uh, if, you want, if you want them, just, uh, I guess, email me <laughs> and I'll, I'll, uh, I'd be more than happy. So you can see here clearly the bond pads, but there's extra bond pads. So I, I don't see the security here. You've got, uh, this is VCC, this is reset, and this is your clock. Now these pads are abnormal and I think it's because they assume that the people that would actually uh, aluminum wedge bond th this package were, were retarded or, or something because I don't understand why they make different pads than, than the others. But they've brought pretty much the whole bus of the internal outside right here. So all of these pads were, were, were technically, if you rebonded them out, you could, you could see the whole program memory running on, in the outside world without a probe station. You know? So, and down, down here you have the ground and you've got the, the I.O. line. Very basic smart card from the old days. This chip got hacked very fast. Everybody was watching Sky for free that, and uh, it was, was, these were good times. Um, <laughs> I, now I don't condemn it but I don't, I don't, I don't uh, promote it. <laughs> so it was very, it was gray there though. It was, you know, couldn't get a subscription but the signal came in their yard. Kind of like Canada and the States. So you can see down here, and I'm jumping around because half of you guys have never even seen a chip possibly. So I'm trying to go slow and take this from the beginning to the, to the, uh, to, uh, to today. The early, early days till today. So, but what you can see here, what you're looking at here are basically eight instruction register latches. Um, and so basically these work like a 74 uh, HC 573. Anybody work with that type of a TTL, you know, logic device? Yeah. So you, you have a gate that controls the, the latch and it's transparent when it's high and when it goes low it holds whatever value is presented. So you can see the data bus is coming in here. Give it a second here. Good old, this is an SSD drive and it's so slow. Um, so right here you've got the data bus coming in and you can see where the V is plugged down. You got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Eight bits. So th in theory if you sit on this, you, this is where you know you'll see the actual op code being fetched, and you'll see the, some of the data bytes too. You won't see all of them though, because of the way the von Neumann architecture was um, was was designed into this. And so, if you if you think about it, you can use two needles to dump this chip. Anybody have any ideas how? Anybody? You can use one on the latch gate clock, and you can use one that walks the data bus. So you put one needle down on the latch and when, when the timing's right that you see an instruction that says like um, f fetch your opcode and then the next clock cycle it says fetch your next opcode, it's perfect. So in two clock cycles you get two opcodes fetched. Now that's not really the case on the old 6805s because I, they had a, d a divide by 